<sighs> Good morning, Harmony Church. How are we doing this morning? Good, how fitting it is to think about. We've been in a sermon series talking about loving like Jesus and how fitting it is to hear rescue story. I think we can all uh, relate to that. When we think about where we've been in our life and we can say we are where we are because it is Jesus who loved us the most. Amen. <clears throat> But you think about over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about what it looks like, what it feels like to love like Jesus. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, Larry has introduced this amazing word called grace. We've learned about it, uh, what it looks like in our life. Today, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what it means to give grace to others. It's something that's really hard to do. And I think about when you think about the word grace, how many of us are just amazed at God's grace. We can think of a time in our life where we've probably felt that, we've seen it, and what that means to each one of us is something special. I was reminded as I prepared for this, the whole Got Milk slogan, if you guys remember that a couple of years ago. I remember we did, working with youth, we've done, you know, Got Jesus, Got Faith, and I thought about, hmm, how fitting it is to say, Got Grace, question mark. But by the end of this sermon, my hope is that we say, Got Grace, exclamation point. When I think about that, I think of the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That God is so patient with us when he doesn't have to be. You see, he forgave, he restored, he gives us second and third chances, some of us (laughs) ten. But Apostle Paul calls it ministry. And it's because everyday life, because our lives are to be ministries back to God. He says in all circumstances, every day, every way, we are to remember that the grace given to us should be a motivation to give grace to others when we come in contact with them. I look around today and I think about in the ministry, which I've been in for quite a long time now, which is amazing because I'm only 25. (laughs) Yeah, you guys don't believe that either. It's great. (laughs) I was eating powdered donuts. That's what this is. (laughs) But I look around today and I'm reminded, you guys know I'm in school and so I get to talk to people. And as I go to things like this special walk and I'm reminded of just sitting back and looking. You know, for somebody like me, I see people that have been stretched to their max emotionally, physically, spiritually, so much affliction and so much trouble. And sometimes we don't take the time to really focus on just that. And he tells us that he won't give us more than we can handle, but it's hard. I think we are imperfect people surrounded by imperfect people, and only the perfect grace of God can supply us with what we need to love and accept those around us. And when you think about accepting those around us, this this simple, simple thing to do, but yet we make it so hard. Grace is far more than this unclear notion of tolerating somebody. We have to accept them, and it goes so much further. It means living joyfully according to a possibility rather than in this demand or obligation that we feel like we have to tolerate somebody. When the Christian concept of grace is applied to the way a society lives, it becomes one of the most radical principles of life. Yes, I said radical. Because it can, sometimes it can blow your mind when you live it. It is prepared to give others what they really do not deserve. In Jesus' life and death, we see God at work. We see Jesus doing something spectacular for each one of us. Jesus told stories about grace that have the most powerful messages. So let's talk about loving like Jesus again. The Bible says that we are to love one another. It's tough, right? I think about, sounds good, this concept of love. Yeah, that's good too. This concept of love, but can we do it? Whoever said, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. was right right? Think about it. Even people at church can be difficult to love. I know for me, sometimes we sing this chorus in church, and I was reminded of this story I read when I was preparing this. We sing this chorus that says, I'm so glad you're a part of the family of God, but when we really sometimes look down into it, we may look at that person beside us and say, I'm surprised you're a part of the family of God. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard enough to love our own family, right? For me as a kid, I remember going to family reunions and it was like this big gossip fest. Can you believe Ronnie, uncle, blah, 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 third cousin did this, said this? I'm thinking at 11 years old, going, why do you have to talk about somebody? But it's true. One guy told his wife that if she had really loved him, 
she would have married someone else. <laughs> right? So how do we make love and grace this dominating characteristic of our life? I think, indeed, loving people is difficult, especially when we've had a hardship because we don't know what it is for people to love us. Yet, this is what the Bible commands. In 1 John 3.11, it says, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We spend time on what we think is important in our life. I mean, think about it. For many of us, those choices can be valid. I mean, you put your time with family and friends, your work, your prayer time. Maybe it's serving the poor. Maybe it's fighting for rights. Maybe it's protesting wrongs. Maybe it's posting something political on Facebook, which I don't do at all. But as the scripture reminds us, if we go further in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, and if I donate or if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. <clears throat> Even though we have the freedom to set our own priorities, Jesus made a point of defining certain ones of them for us. Think about it. In Matthew 22, 37 and 39, he says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That doesn't say, well, I'll give him a little piece of my heart today, but tomorrow I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, then, is not this gray area in the scriptures. It's pretty straightforward that we are to love with all our heart, all our soul, and with all our mind. And sometimes that's hard to do. Jesus gave love this priority over all other Christian virtues. Every thought, response, and act of goodwill must first pass through this fine filter of love, or it means nothing at all. In the book Strength to Love, Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged us to realize that our responsibility as Christians is to discover the meaning of that command and seek passionately to live it out in our daily lives. But why love? Why grace? What makes these two so important? When Jesus spoke to the disciples regarding the first and second greatest commands, he explained in Matthew twenty-two forty. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And it is written in John fourteen fifteen that if you love me, keep my commands. Yet Jesus also said in John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He doesn't say, you've got to love each other sometimes. <laughs> he says it clearly right there. So you must love one another. The Apostle Paul goes on to tell us in Romans 13, 10, he says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Fulfillment is a huge word. I love saying that because I'm learning that in school. It's a special word. Fulfillment. That means full. Fulfillment. Being full of. Being satisfied. Fulfillment of the law. It means you're doing something right here. And if love is that fulfillment of the law. I think when we demonstrate Christian love, it distinguishes, it distinguishes believers from the rest of the world. And Jesus goes on to say in John 13, 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Notice Jesus didn't say that people will know you because you promote this agenda that I have. It's because you're wearing this WWJD bracelet or this shirt that says, I love Jesus. Or maybe one that's pointing to him going, I'm with this guy. As they walked, doing his mission. From the very beginning, God's plan was to develop a people that reflected who he was and what he stood for. And what is that? Love. Scripture says God is love. In 1 John 4, 16, 17. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment in the world that we are like Jesus. I'm going to tell you, introduce to you a gentleman by the name of Ira Gillette. And I really wish Melissa was here to hear this. This was so cool. I thought about her. He was a missionary to East Africa. One of her dreams. As you can kind of see, he's holding a cheetah, mini tiger, whatever that is, I can't see. 
But Ira Gillette was a missionary to East Africa, and he told this story one time of when he returned home to report on all the things that he had seen on his mission trips. And he related this interesting phenomenon and wondered why we, in his own backyard, couldn't do it. And repeatedly, Gillette had noticed how groups of Africans would walk past government hospitals and travel all these extra miles to receive medical treatment at this missionary compound that he would go and serve. And he finally asked this particular group, he said, hey, look, 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 look. why are you walking all these extra miles when the same treatments are available right here, right here in front of you at all these government clinics? Why are you going way out of the way when you can get the same treatment right here? And this is how they respond. The medicines may be the same, but the hands are different. That kind of love makes a difference. Christ has no hands, but our hands. No feet, but our feet. We are his ambassadors, representing him to the people in your own backyard. And when we love as he loved us, it makes a huge difference. People will notice. And while love is this wonderful, warm feeling, it's not only just a feeling. In fact, according to the Bible, love is primarily an active interest in the well-being of another person. Love acts for the benefit of others. According to William Barclay, love is the spirit in the heart that will never seek anything but the highest good of its fellow man. I want to introduce you to another gentleman. Dr. W.A. Criswell is a former pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And stories say that he officiated a lot of weddings. This nervous groom, if you can imagine, would always go to him. And Dr. Criswell would tell this story. And the groom would say, Dr. Criswell, how much do I owe you for this service that you're doing? And he'd always smile and look back at the groom and say, just pay me what she's worth. See, Dr. Criswell made a lot of money doing this. <laughs> because to each man, his new bride was of extravagant value. Think about that. As I wrap my mind around that, in the light, in the same type of attitude, shouldn't we have that same type of value and, give, and those others around us have that same meaning to us? Because here's the thing, each of us in this room right now has some type of incredible value to God as a potential object of His grace. His one and only Son died in your place. Because people matter so much to Him, they ought to matter to us. And we therefore need to love them as He loves them. But let's talk about this concept of grace. How do we apply it to that idea of loving others? And I thought about that. Grace. It's funny, as I was preparing this sermon, if you guys know the scene, and uh, I think it might have been one of the Lampoon Christmas movies where he says, Chevy Chase says, say grace. And so she says, grace, she died years ago. But you think about it, I think we all have this misconception of what grace means, especially in our life. Until we've experienced, how do we give that to other people? See, grace is a word that's thrown around a lot in the religious world. Maybe people think about how God's grace gives them power to do what they're unable to do on their own. Or maybe it's because they remember how the grace of God gives them what they don't deserve to have. Like forgiveness. Or love. Or strength. And I think we're all eager for God to pour his grace out on us. But we need to remember what 1 Peter 5.5 5 says. He says, in the same way, you younger people must submit yourselves to your elders. And all of you must put on the apron of humility to serve one another. For the scripture says, God resists the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Favor, grace to the humble. We cannot be proud and confident in ourselves and expect to receive God's grace when we need it. When we intentionally remember how gracious God has been to us, it's a lot easier to give grace to others. It's so easy to get busy with our lives and forget God's goodness towards us, but each day we should recall and think about and remember how God's grace has been poured out toward us. In fact, Ephesians 2, 7, and 8 reminds us in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace 
expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself, it's the gift of God. Everyone has good days and bad days. Let me ask you, have you ever gone into a restaurant or an office or a gas station and encountered an unhappy worker? <laughs> Chances are that that employee was probably having a bad day. So how do we handle that? Do we get upset when he or she isn't as courteous or responsive as we expect them to be? Or do we extend grace by kind of being extra kind and understanding and creating a conversation with them? Because at some point they may tell you why they're having a bad day. But if we'll be honest and put ourselves in other people's shoes and try to understand what they're going through, it's a lot easier to show grace and kindness. So rather than getting upset or taking things personally when someone treats you badly, I think we should try to put ourselves in his or her shoes and we'll find that showing grace to that person isn't so difficult at all. We've all experienced it. I mean, that certain difficult, cranky, hard to get along with person who knows exactly how to push your buttons don't nudge the person next to you. Please don't do that. <laughs> but do we have to give grace to these kinds of people? I mean, you think about it. You know those people that intentionally push your buttons. Do we have to give grace to those people? I think we already know the answer. And the truth is, is that these are people who need grace extended to them the most. Maybe we say, they don't deserve it. Exactly. That's why it's called Grace. It's unearned, it's unmerited, it's undeserved, and that's what makes it so beautiful. That's what attracted us to Jesus in the first place, right? I mean, and when we offer grace to people who don't deserve it, maybe they'll be drawn to Jesus too. And sometimes it's hardest to give grace to the people who are closest to us. I mean, maybe it's because we have higher expectations for them, so we are so familiar to them because we just don't think about the importance of sending that grace to them. I ask you to challenge yourself to see your loved ones and friends through these new eyes. Put yourself in their position and try to understand what they may be going through. In doing that, you'll find it easier to offer grace to the people you love the most. Think about Jesus. He left the glory of heaven to come to earth. And what did it get him? In John 1.11, he came to which, that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Can you imagine being away on like a business trip for a week, coming home and your family don't recognize you? That's similar to what Jesus experienced when he came to earth. Think about it. He had to have been hurt. When we deny him, when we deny that grace for somebody else, how do you think that makes him feel? And as Jesus hung on the cross, dying for the, these people that he loved, as he was being hurled all these abuses, scorn spit on, made fun of, his heart was broken, and yet he forgave him. Grace looks directly at sin and points it out specifically because of love. Grace changes us. It doesn't excuse us. So what does it mean to give grace to one another? How are we to love like Jesus? And how have we shown this love and grace to other people? I think in the end, the goal of the Christian life is definitely love. But there is hope for the one who has failed in love. Can we do it? Can we love others this same way that Jesus loves us? The answer is afraid, no. We cannot love others like Christ without him. The Lord who forgave even those who crucified him stands ready to forgive each one of us. And forgive that lack of love that we haven't shown to maybe even ourselves. He wants to show his grace toward us today, to cleanse our loveless hearts and fill it with his loving spirit. I think we have to allow him to teach us to show that to others. See, Jesus knew that all people would give an account to only to God. And the Lord knew that Paul would write in Romans, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I think ultimately how we show grace to others 
We have to ask the Lord for the grace to stop condemning them, first off. And we have to ask the Lord to give us a greater understanding of this diversity of His creation and a more tolerances and tolerance for the differences that we find in the people and the situations around us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and glorify your name. When it comes to grace, it's something we want, something that's hard to give, but we gladly accept it. Father God, I pray today that you touch the hearts of our congregation, that you allow us to understand what that grace means for us, and in finding that joy and what it means for us, that we pass it along to the next person that needs it the most. So we thank you for who you are and what you mean to each of us. It's in your name I pray. Amen.